Industry on Parade. A pictorial review of events in business and industry produced each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. The Sudbury Basin of Ontario, chief source of one of the precious resources of the free world, nickel. Let's follow as the miners who bring this important metal out of the earth prepare to go underground. Work clothes, thoroughly aired and dried between shifts, are put on. Then the miners pick up their electric headlamps, making sure the batteries are well charged. Now we're set to go underground. Traffic in the elevator shafts is more carefully controlled than on the streets of the best-run city. For in addition to great quantities of supplies and tools, men must also be transported up and down many times a day. In an underground stove, a diamond drilling operation is in progress to determine the extent and quality of the ore. Ore samples are sent to the surface to be analyzed and recorded by the geologist. To mine nickel, blast holes are drilled in a drift and loaded with dynamite. Fuses inserted and tamped, then sealed in with a clay cartridge. As the fuses are fired, the extensive ventilating system draws off the powder fumes. These men and all others will have plenty of time to get well away from the area before the blast occurs. Seconds after the blast, all dust and smoke have been whisked away, and the job of clearing the ore and rock broken off by the explosion gets underway. The International Nickel Company operates this and five other mines in the Sudbury region, and is continuing an extensive exploration program for development of additional new mines. After nickel was first discovered here, it took continuing years of research by the company to find the many ways in which nickel can serve mankind. The metal which had proved itself in World War I was then no longer required in quantities available until new markets had been developed. Since that time, its usefulness has grown steadily, especially as an alloy to give greater strength or special properties to other metals. Today, it is considered one of the most important materials of peace or for defense. International Nickel's foresight brought tremendous expansion of its peacetime mining and processing facilities, which placed the Allied nations in a position of preparedness at the outbreak of World War II, despite the early losses of other nickel refineries in Norway and France. Once again, the nickel industry is called on to meet the challenge to our way of life and is further expanding its mining developments. The days of rough and rugged mining camp life are all in the past. Now, miners in the Sudbury Basin live much like workers in free communities anywhere. The men who produce nickel have as big a stake as any of us in the future of our democratic society. The machines and tools you see on Industry on Parade were purchased by men and women of all walks of life who risked their savings by investing in American industry. America's 14 million stockholders put up the money to start a business or to help it grow. A recent survey indicates that it now takes an average of about $11,200 per employee to set up a manufacturing business. This survey also shows that increasing costs are making it harder to find people who, after paying their taxes, can spare enough cash to invest in new businesses, which in turn can and do create new jobs. Brighton and arithmetic. Methods of educating children may change from year to year, but some things remain basic. And one of the principal tools used in filling little heads with knowledge is still the pencil. Let's go to the Eagle Pencil Company in New York City to learn what goes into this product so familiar to everyone. Raw materials include wax, wood, brass, rubber, lacquer, and most especially, the clay and graphite we see being mixed here. They'll be ground together for weeks until the two are thoroughly blended in a ratio that's determined by the hardness of the pencil lead being made. The more clay, the more hardness. 
After other intermediary steps, the lead is extruded as a continuous black shoestring. The leads are laid out straight and dried, then cut to length. These leads would write, but they're much too soft to serve in a pencil, so next they'll be packed into crucibles and fired in white hot gas ovens. The clay vitrifies under heat, forming a rigid ceramic structure with each tiny cell loaded with graphite. And when they come out of the oven, the leads are much stronger and more durable. Now they're ready to be enclosed in wood. Each grooved cedar slat receives the leads for eight pencils. By this time, the leads have been waxed for smoother writing and then treated with a chemical that allows glue to adhere to the waxed lead and to the wood. Other grooved slats go on top to form a sandwich. The glued sandwich dries under heavy pressure, becoming firmly bonded wood to wood and wood to lead. After they're thoroughly dry, they're fed into a shaping machine that gives them their hexagonal or round shape, one side at a time. First, the tops. An ingenious machine flips them over to be shaped on the other side. Now, they are pencils, but a few more steps remain. They must be sanded smooth, lacquered, and stamped with the brand name and the number that indicates the degree of hardness. Finally, erasers and metal tips are attached, and the Eagle pencil is complete. Most of us consider a pencil as simple as it is essential, but when you're first learning how to handle one, it can be a very complicated instrument indeed. Vital to America's civilian and military production program, the big cranes and other machines for handling ore, coal, or any product or material of great bulk and weight. One of the leaders in the manufacture of the powerful hoists, car dumpers, larries, pile drivers, and similar equipment is the Industrial Brown Hoist Corporation of Bay City, Michigan. From here, for the railroad yards, shipyards, and other busy industrial centers, come those giant hoists that can pick up loads weighing hundreds of tons. Here we see the assembly of a 50-ton tractor-type hoist. There are many vital jobs on which this machine can help in defense of the Western world. Its power will come from this diesel engine, although industrial brown hoist does have many steam-powered models. The firms that were merged to form this manufacturing company have been in business for more than half a century. They helped build our unexcelled industrial machine, and now they help expand it to meet all possible emergencies. Out of the plant rolls a 75-ton railroad crane that, despite its size and strength, can be maneuvered almost as easily as a jeep. With this, heavy loads can be shifted from point to point in a hurry and placed exactly where they belong. Highly responsive controls make the operator's duties a breeze. It'll get some final adjustments, then move on to the big job ahead. Dollars being printed in the Bureau of Engraving in Washington. Each one is supposed to represent one dollar or 100 cents. But when we go to spend our dollars, we find they'll only buy half that amount. The other half has been destroyed by inflation, created by more money than goods available to buy. Some of the ways all of us can help check further inflation is to avoid borrowing to buy unnecessary things. Save all the money we can and do not waste materials. Work more efficiently and thus hold down costs and prices. 
and all of us must be willing to pay necessary government costs as we go to prevent greater national debt. Help check further inflation now. Industry on Parade turns back the clock a few years to watch four men who used to work at the various installations of General Petroleum Corporation, a Sacconi Vacuum Oil Company affiliate on the West Coast. These men don't perform their familiar tasks anymore. Here's what they're doing today, just relaxing and enjoying life in whatever way happens to suit their fancy. Johnny Scott of Los Angeles was a boiler washer in General Petroleum's refining department from 1913 until he retired in 1946. Now, from the fund made up of his own voluntary contributions over the years, plus what the company contributed, interest and social security, Johnny is independent, free to spend the good many years he has left doing what he enjoys most, fishing. His boat is a good-sized, sturdily built craft with a hull that'll take five tons of fish. He derives some profit from his fishing activities, but he continues to look on it as a sport just the same. Even the work of keeping the boat and gear shipshape can be fun for a man who never has to be in a hurry for anybody or anything. Another retired Sacconi vacuum employee is former electrician Jack Carpenter, who's devoting much of his days in retirement to a project that used to get only his spare time, helping the blind. Jack and Mrs. Carpenter have been interested in the Braille Institute for many years, and now there's nothing to keep them from devoting as much attention to this admirable work as they please. At one of two thrift shops operated by Mrs. Carpenter, Jack helps sell used clothing and other items, the proceeds going to help the blind. Our next call on a veteran of the Flying Red Horse Companies brings us to the basement workshop of Clarence de Groff, a pumper who was with the company from 1926 until January of 1951. Now he makes and repairs furniture and other house and garden equipment for his family and friends. At last he has as much time for his hobby as he's always wanted. There's only one thing to worry a man who's retired, the danger of inflation causing that fixed monthly income, however generous, to shrink away to practically nothing. Now we're at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Eddie Lemmert. He was with Sacconi Vacuum for years before he retired in 1950. Their biggest enjoyment comes from getting out into the western wilderness for days on end, hunting and fishing. Right now, they're preparing for another trip that can last as long as they want it to. It's a future of ease and happiness Stalin's slave laborers can never look forward to. But for retired Americans like these, rosy dreams ahead. Mm -hmm. 